Evening. Depending where you are, right here now it is my time. Yes. Um, today we're going to be talking about concepts. And I want to talk about this because it's something that's very um, dear to me, um, something that's quite abstract, so it's interesting to play with. Um, and it's got a um, kind of gives the backbone to what architecture is. And it's a lot of the kind of studies that we do and the kind of thinking that we do is geared around um, what a concept is and how to implement it in an architectural context. Um, you'll see in front of you a bunch of images of different buildings, all with different kind of content, concepts, and we're going to run through it. Hey, Fuxia, well, hi. It is good to see you on the chat. Don't worry about today being a long one. It's going to be actually quite quick. Um, this is actually for you in a way, Fuxia, because concept is similar to narrative. Um, so I hope you enjoy. Um, all right, let's get into it. So, what is a concept? Um, <laughs> it is an abstract idea. Um, very easy to understand. However, um, we need to we need to kind of unpack what that means. What is an abstract idea? Um, well, an idea we, by looking at the definition of it, um, it is a plan or an intention, as the bottom right here kind of shows you. Um, and or it is an idea or an intervention that helps sells, publicize a commodity that's so random. And um, this is from Google. Um, but I think the, the more important question to ask actually is, um, well, if this is, that's what an idea is, an abstract idea, what does abstract mean? Um, and I think the key definition here is that it's not physical and it's not concrete, um, which is very interesting because a building is inherently concrete. It's, um, it exists in the real world, um, it has to deal with certain parameters like rain, it has to have people inside it, um, it has to have cars inside it, um, they, all of these, it has to abide to, by the laws of the city. So there's all these parameters that kind of sit on this thing. And yet I'm talking about an abstract idea within that world. And that's what's so amazing about architecture is that it fuses these two. It fuses the concrete, the existing, the real with something much more poetic and interesting um, and abstract. And now that we know what the concept is, uh, forward. Oh, sorry, this was supposed to kind of go together. Okay. So what we can say is that um, a concept is an abstract design driver. Now you might ask yourself, well, what is a design driver? Um, and the answer to that is you get diff very different types of drivers. Um, I hope you're liking the Pulp Fiction references here. Um, so in a real world, you get external um, drivers. So that's, you know, context, um, brief, the client wants, the kind of laws of the country, sites. I'm just going to read off this whole list here so you can just kind of look at it yourself. But basically it's external factors um, can be an and are, are drivers, and they're basically limiting factors on what the design can be. Um, you know, the functionality of it, all of those kind of things are pushed onto the project, and that's an external, and that's basically what a driver is. It, it forces, it's a parameter that forces the design into a certain direction. Um, but concept is an interesting one because that's actually an internal driver. It's something that you choose for yourself. What do you want the project to be? Um, what kind of narrative do you want the project to create? Um, do you want it to be very theoretical? Do you want to be grounded? Do you want to feel comfortable? Do you want to feel relaxed? Do you want to feel agitated? Do you want to feel confused? All of those kinds of things, uh, those emotions that you want to create can be considered drivers. And all of those will link into the kind of concept you want to create. Um, it can be a very simple complex, uh, content, uh, concept. It can be a very complex concept. It really depends on how you want to react. But it is very much your own, it is your own um, identity that you're putting onto the project. Um, and Sure, you can say that um, if you, you know, every person will respond to the external drivers, the external parameters differently, and yes, that's true. But this is this is bigger than that. This is um, talking about infusing 
a building with something more than just um, functionality. It's, it's about a narrative that you're creating into, and you're forcing into the building, not forcing, but you're infusing into the building. And if you don't have that narrative, if you don't have that concept, um, even if it's super simple, um, then you'll, you'll, you're, you're going to lose the architecture and you're going to lose the humanity and you're just going to be creating another building. Um, and what I strive for and I want to like kind of engage this, this kind of, you know, where we're going with this kind of idea is to start creating and building richer experiences. And the way you do that is by layering things on top of each other. That you, in terms of, um, when I say layering things on top of each other, layering different experiences, different emotions, different senses, all of these layering will create richer experiences. You get different types of concepts, um, like you get different types of actors. Um, you know, you get the, 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 the leading man, the heartthrob. You also get the introverted, effective kind of actor. All of these concepts and all of these different actors will create different moods and different feelings for the end user. Um, so if you, if you think of you know, Nicolas Cage, for instance, or whoever these kinds of characters are, um, you can't imagine, for example, Keanu Reeves acting anything else than what he does. You know, he's got a certain um, skill set that he can do, and within that, he can create a certain movie. Um, you can't imagine um, Keanu Reeves switching with, let's say, Edward Norton or with Kevin Spacey, for instance, or for even, you know, a female lead, for instance. Those things are kind of, you know, that's the kind of character that he can play, Cyberpunk 2077. Um, but, you know, they, they're kind of fixed in that kind of mold. And that's the same with the concept. Um, you know, you get very grounded and very easy concepts, but you can also get very complex and theoretical. And Evening, my man. How's it, Roland Mansa? It is good to have you on board. Um, today's a quick one, actually. I'm, I'm actually running through this exceptionally quickly. <laughs> Um, so you'll see, I mean, I'm halfway through already. Um, I've been sitting on playing on this kind of uh, presentation for about um, an hour and a half. Although I've thought about it for, for weeks already. Um, and we're talking about concepts. I mean, you're, you're well, well um, versed in this already, so you're probably good. Let's quickly run through some different design concepts that you can get um, going through while, while looking at buildings. Um, so... <laughs> Um, all right, so this is a building in, um, in Austria. It's, um, it's, you've seen it on the stream before. Um, it's a, a building um, designed by Zaha Hadid, um, built in 2007, I think. I'm not going to know all these buildings, building dates, but for this one I do. And if you look at it, um, I probably should have shown movement as a key driver and said, yeah, it's, I would completely agree with that, Fuxia. That is a very fair assessment to make. I felt the same when I was there. Uh, hey, <laughs> hey, Mel, what's up? Good to have you online. Uh, welcome joining for joining us. Um, speaking of which, if you want to join the Discord, I'll I'll, I'll send you an invite. Um, but anyway, so we've seen this building, but this building's main driver, the main focus, the main concept behind it, um, is essentially movement, and and you can see that in in these very sweeping lines that the building is creating. Um, and it will, we'll look at to go through different photographs that you'll see that. And, and, you know, creating angles and having this kind of thing move around. So what's happening is your eyes kind of tracking through the building. And because it's doing that, it's creating the sense of movement. Um, again, you'll see this is on the facade of the building. Um, you know, these fins and elements that create, again, this idea of movement. Um, from the side, even this, the fact that this building almost feels like it's going to fall over. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely right, Mel. That's exactly. I still want to go to Maxi Museum, um, but hopefully, hopefully that building doesn't do the same. Um, and if you look at the internal side, it's the same thing. It's got this very large atrium kind of um, glass panel on the roof, and you can see how it sweeps around the corner, and it's leading your eye around the corner. Um, similarly, with elements over here, and the fact that the lights are staggered, all of this is adding to this idea of movement. Um, and and that's and even this ramp sweeping up those all of that gives suggestion and addition to the idea of movement and that's something that you'll see in, in her buildings are very she's very good at is she doesn't just um, when she comes up with a concept and her her concepts generally were to do with movement um, she you know that was very much this dynamic kind of architecture is what she was really striving for um, and it was a, a theme 
that ran through most of the buildings. Um, and, and, and so here you can see, you know, like for example, the columns where normally these columns would be straight, um, you know, she's angled them and broken them apart, you know, so she's created this idea that you create more lines. And again, that it pulls your eye upward and it's leading you up towards the ceiling. Um, and so all of her drivers, all everything is to do with movement, the concept. So, I'm, and again, my sense, what I mentioned earlier is that, you know, the, the idea of concept, it's an internal story that she's trying to create. It's not, um, it's not an external story. Um, it's not like someone's telling her, I want a building that looks like movement. Um, you know, that's, that's her architectural component that she's bringing to it. That's her personality. It's her soul that she's bringing to the building. Um, loving all the emojis. I'm going to have to make some um, unfold emojis. All right, so the next one is um, Hanging Gardens. These are all buildings that I've visited myself and kind of explored, and, and, and um, some of them I liked a lot. For example, this one, I, I really loved this building. And, and you'll see it's actually not a building. It's a public place, a uh, public plaza. And, and what they've done is they've got this, you know, the steel structure um, around a square. So the, you know, the, there's a square in the, um, in the city block, roads running on either side. And they've kind of just built this big box that hangs off it. Um, and this is in, in Switzerland, rather. So when you go visit your brother, you can go check out this building. And what they've done is they've created these, these, these networks or these cables hanging off the top of it. And that allows these creepers to kind of grow up it. And so all of this is a basically this idea of reinforcing this idea of hanging gardens, and floating gardens, um, you know, running through all the way. Um, if you guys have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask me. I am speaking at a lightning speed. Um, all right. And this is a design built by, um, a designing by uh, Lord, Norman, Lord Norman Foster, the British architect. And this was a, this is a very interesting project. Um, it's super um, successful. Um, it was, it's a glass dome. It's in um, Berlin. Um, this is um, the Reichstag um, building. It's their parliament, essentially, in Germany. And there's a bit of a history to this building um, because it was demolished. It was, it was actually um, destroyed by the Soviets. Um, in 1936, it was bombed, well, uh, it was a fire, um, and the Nazis used that to kind of rise to power. And so there was this, it's got a very tainted history to it, you know, it's very complicated. And, 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 and so what Foster then did is that he wanted to create a building that led to this idea of accountability. And if you look at it like, well, how does a building have accountability to it? Um, you know, it, it is just, it's just a building, right? But um, if you think of the idea of transparency, um, linking to that idea of accountability so that, you know, the people, this is a public space. You don't pay access to go to this building. There's a queue, you have to get a ticket, but there's no, there's no payment required. Um, so a person, a, any kind of average Joe can, can kind of go to this building. And more importantly, this glass dome allows them to kind of, um, they, they travel through the history of this building as they're moving up it. So you, you kind of start at the bottom over here and you're moving up. It. And as you're moving up, um, you'll see that you're actually um, you're able to look down into this glass kind of dome structure down here. And what's underneath that is the parliament. Um, so what's actually happening is that um, the, 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 the people in this building you know, if your parliament is down here, there's a symbolism here that's happening. So that the people that these, these parliamentarians are serving are above them, and they're looking down on them. And you can almost say they're judging them, they're holding them to account. So just by the mere fact of doing it from an, from an architectural point of view, you're reinforcing this idea that the politicians are, are, are servants to the people. And that's done purely through architecture. And it's even though it's suggestive, it still has a lot of power to it. Because if you think of, um, if you think of, let's say, sitting at a table, right? You know, you've got your your father sitting and your mother maybe, and brother and your sisters or something like that. The the father always sorry sits at the head of the table, right? And 
because of that, he's given power. Right? And power is a very strange thing, and there's a lot of follow philosophies around that. I'm not going to get into that. But essentially, um, because he's at the head of the table, he has the power of the room. He commands everyone to look. He can simultaneously look very easily at everyone. Even from a, just a geomet geometric point of view, he's got the most power. And also vice versa, that person carries the most power. Now, in my household, we didn't have a father figure. So there wasn't this male dominant, you know, it was my mother. And we sat, she actually didn't want that. She didn't want us to sit across from each other. I mean, in that kind of sense, she wanted a more democratic household. Even though the table was rectangular, we all sat on the short, on the long sides. So there was no one person that was kind of dominating it. Another way to kind of create that kind of sense of, of, of e equality is to have a round table. Everyone is equal. Everyone can see everyone equally. There's no one person that kind of dominates the scene. So the, the setting, the, the kind of the, 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 the framing or the stage upon which we, we look at um, the world influences the way we see the world. So this building, by the mere fact that it creates this kind of atmosphere where the, 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 the um, people, the citizenry, are able to look down and essentially dominate and control the politicians. Um, okay, I'm just going to read Fuchs here. It reminds me of, um, of a history lesson of the Vatican City. The Pope sits at the balcony of a building that looks like it embraces the audience, symbolizes God embracing all people. Exactly. And that, that's exactly um, what concept is actually about. And although I, I showed you, you know, the Zaha Deep building and the, the Hanging Gardens, to me, those are very, um, fr not frivolous, but, but empty almost um, concepts. They're very light and easy. And as I was mentioning about the different types of concepts you get, the different types of actors that you get, you get the heavy, brooding Anthony Hopkins actor. And that's what this is, accountability as a concept. Is a very heavy, strong concept. And therefore, the building had to respond in a way that justifies that. So if we look back again at this, even the form, these are, these are mirrors that you look down on. It. And by looking, if you're standing over here, you can look down. Uh, the angle's a bit off there. I think if you're higher up, you can look down into the, the, the parliamentarian's um, room. And... This, this idea of, of accountability in, um, um, in buildings has come up quite a lot in, in political buildings. Um, and thank you, Fuxia. I'm glad you enjoy them. Um, and this, is, this, I think, is the precursor to that idea. And there's an interesting story around this building, is that um, there's another famous architect that proposed this idea as a competition, in the competition, and said, oh, you know, did a, did a whole presentation of everything. This is the building. It needs to be this glass dome. And, Da, 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 and there was this whole spiel and, and the other architect, Norman Foster, was watching this presentation and while he was watching it, he just thought, this guy's absolutely right. But the reason behind why he wants to do a glass dome is correct. So he had a full presentation, models, everything. They spent months on this thing, you know, so many meetings, so much time, so many hours, and he just scrapped all of it in a moment and said, no, this is wrong. What we're proposing is wrong. And he, by hand, did a quick sketch of what he wants to propose, which was a glass dome. And he went up in front and he had no drawings, nothing, no model, model, no presentation. And he just spoke about what the people of Germany are and what um, their new building, their new parliament, head of parliament building needs to be and what it needs to signify. And he got them so psyched up on the idea behind it. And he said, and that's why it has to be a glass dome. And everyone loved it and he won the competition. And that kind of emphasizes the idea that it's not really what we do that's so important. It's why we do it. It's how we do it. And, and so when we're doing architecture, when you're doing design, it's really kind of think about that and start actually engaging with that level of thought and that level of subject matter. Um, right, so that's accountability. Um, and I've shown these other buildings in the beginning of the presentation. I'll just quickly run, show them again at the end here. And I don't know, these seem a bit frivolous after the, the conversation about the uh, accountability as a concept. But, I mean, okay, actually, I was going to talk about some other stuff, but I think, I think looking at these buildings is kind of, um, well, actually, just run through them. So 
over here, um, this is a, sorry, that's a, um, a glass, these glass um, um, buildings in a forest. And the idea behind them is essentially that they mirror what's going on around them. So when you look at them, you don't see a building per se, you just see a glass box that, or a mirror box that reflects nature. Um, and so it, 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 it basically disappears. Um, you know, it's a trick of the mind. It's not perfect, obviously. I mean, you can see it's not perfect, but it is very close. Um, so the concept there was like to, to disappear, to, to, to um, you know, kind of become one with nature in a literal sense. Um, you know, so that's, these are much more frivolous and light kind of concepts. And then over here, this is, a, uh, this is one of my favorite architects. His name is Richard Rogers. Him and Norman Foster are very, um, they're both, um, you know, quite old. I think they're in the 80s. Um, they're still doing a very impressive work, uh, still very active in the field. And this is, a, this is called the Cheese, well, its nickname is the Cheese Grater. It's in, um, in London. And um, this building, its main concept is actually to expose the structure. Um, and you can see that with these very pronounced kind of um, structural elements that take place and these, these kind of zigzags that run up. And a lot of that is done because to kind of free up the floor space. And now I've got another building that I want us to analyze, kind of look at that will deal with, you know, what's actually happening in this building. Um, because I find this building as a bit, is, is, is an evolved concept that happened earlier in, in, in Richard Rogers' career. This over here is just a very simple shed. And, and, and the concept there can just be, you know, it can be something as simple as being one with nature. Um, or, or kind of um, going back to basics, um, or, or you know, simplifying life. Or you know, it doesn't have to be as hardcore and as intense as something as accountability has to be. Um, you know, within that, there's you know, again, like you can, they're actors that you can you can kind of um, change the level at which you operate or the level at which you. Am I lagging? Gosh, I don't want to lag. Um, and this building at the bottom left, um, so this, this is in Berlin, and it's called the um, Berlin Memorial, um, Holocaust Memorial, designed by Peter Eisenman. And it's actually not even a building, it's just a public plaza. Actually just... Hmm. I'll have to sort my internet out. Having, I've, I've kind of moved cables, so push cables around so it's not ideal but I'll I'll fix that and I'll put a ugh, irritating but do you still hear everything it's not like it like buffers a little bit it's not like you're missing things because if you're missing things that's just not great I think it's my internet actually although I should be getting I've got the right speeds there's a speed test okay anyway let's let's um Kind of finish off here. So um, this building over here um, is is the Berlin Memorial Holocaust Memorial. And think of a okay, cool. Think of a public plaza. You know, you've got uh, roads on. I think it's on all four sides, and you know you've got buildings on either side. Okay, cool. I'm going on. Um, so you've got buildings on either side. Um, I don't remember the exact context. We're going to do a full analysis of this building, this, this kind of experience, because it is an exceptional building. And this, um, the idea behind this building was, um, so Peter Eisenman is a hardcore theoretician in terms of, he's a deconstructivist, which um, we'll get into, it's not a big deal, but, but he, he, his, his, his architecture is very um, theoretical. And, what this building is essentially is if you imagine these are each of these individual kind of columns that you're seeing there is essentially a very tall column um, that rises up and it's next to you know another very tall column and that column this column changes height to this one to the next one you know, it makes a full-on grid so this whole block is just filled is just a grid essentially that's been filled with these columns that move that move up in different heights, um, so it creates this kind of wave effect, which is what you're seeing over here. And 
At the same time, what's happening is the section, the, the floor is also changing the heights. So this floor is kind of snaking and sweeping. And so when you start on the sides, right, let's say you're kind of this height, you know, the, the stele are about this high, the columns are about this high. And they, they kind of say consistent height. So when you look at it, you see that, you know, they, they're very consistent in height. But the floor keeps dipping down. So you start out up here and you, you know, you're walking. And as you walk down, these columns go higher, higher, and higher. And eventually, at their maximum height, at their maximum height, you're about this tall. Now, imagine how confusing that must be. You're in this space. You've got, there's maybe, I think it's about a, a meter gap between each of these columns. Um, we write in millimeters architect, so you'll have to excuse the weird number maybe. And you can only see in a very straight, and the, the, it's, it's a perfect grid. So you can from here see all the way down and across, and all the way down and across. And when you're, when you're out here looking through, it seems like nothing. But if you're in the center, you know, and you, you can't see anything, you're completely lost. You, can't, you don't have daylight because the sun doesn't get in that deep. You don't have, so you don't have sunshine. You don't have your friends because they keep getting lost. You see glimpses of them. You can't, you can't walk through this together because it's so tight, it's so narrow, it's so claustrophobic. Um, and so what's happening is that this architect ingeniously was able to create the feeling that the Holocaust victims felt during that experience. It was, they felt they, was, they were completely isolated, alone. There was no one with them that could help them through this. They had no idea where to go. They couldn't see light at the end of the tunnel. There was no hope. They felt delirious. And the weird thing is that they, they probably saw it from the outside going, it's not so bad. Looking at this, this memorial, they're kind of thinking, it's not going to be so bad. We'll get out. We'll get through this. It can't be as bad as the reports say. But as soon as you get into it, then the reality actually hits you. And that is where power really resides, is that we can transfer that relationship or that emotion through time and, and, and give people a feeling of what it must have been like to go through that traumatic and absolutely devastating experience. And that's where the power of architecture lies. That's where the power of design lies. It's not so much in a building. It's in a feeling. It's about that humanness that we can create. It's about connection. It's about the soul that we're able to evoke. Like when you watch a read something beautiful, um, or when you watch a movie that just breaks your heart with the emotion that it creates, or fills you with so much energy and joy, buildings can do the same thing. We just have to be reach that kind of level. Um, and so I wanted to talk today about concepts so you guys can get this idea of what 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 are we actually trying to do here? We're not trying to create buildings. Um, you know where a toilet is or where. Um, how many parking bays you need or any of that kind of stuff. It's almost irrelevant. What we're really going after is that humanness, that, that connection. And yeah, so this building will go through in depth on another um, cast, another stream. Um, I hope I've given you a, a good taste of it. Um, just a quick recap. Um, as you're doing designs, it's always important to know why why you're designing what you're designing. When you look at concepts, yeah, exactly. That would be very similar to that Rolamanza. Um, when you're looking at concepts, the big thing is to think about abstraction. I know, Fuxia. Powerful, powerful stuff. I'm glad you could feel it because I was getting a bit emotional. <laughs> oh man. Um, 
And the reason I say abstraction is because abstraction is more powerful than literalism, than being literal. So what I've described now, this whole you know, scene of um, you know, going through that whole memorial and feeling those feelings, that's an abstract concept. It's not literally trying to you know, do, do what you, um, it's not literally trying to make you feel disgusted or morbid or, or terrible. I mean, for argument's sake, there could have been an abattoir and they could have just been slaughtering cows. And that could have, you know, kind of had the same gritty kind of feeling. But it's too much. It's like you can't engage with it. It's so grotesque. Whereas if you, if you um, do it on an abstract level, it's much more subtle and much more powerful. It stays with you because you, you don't have to block it out. So abstraction is super important when you're going to do kind of, kind of the concepts. And when I say concepts, I'm also talking about narratives. Narratives and concepts are very interchangeable. For instance, let's say I'm designing a building that is in a forest or has to, has to kind of evoke the idea of a tree. Now I can start and I can say, okay, fine, I'm gonna, I want a building that literally looks like a tree. There's my building, it's a tree, done. Or I can ask myself, what makes a tree a tree? And I could list things like, well, maybe it filters light. Maybe it, um, it cools. Maybe it's a gathering point or beacon. You'll have to excuse the handwriting, Fuxia. <laughs> um, maybe it's a source of life. Maybe it reminds you of climbing, being a child. Um, maybe it reminds you of abundance or food or tea, which reminds you of family, friends, happiness. So when you start looking at what a tree is, well, of course, sorry, I mean wood, buildings. In African culture, I say African culture, I mean in cultures in Africa, they, there's, um, you know, trees were very much a shaded environment. And tea definitely equals happiness. <laughs> um, they would... You know, these baobabs, for instance, or any kind of tree, would there'd be a, you know, an elder kind of telling a story, and there'd be people sitting around and listening. And so trees literally signified, you know, were story places, community, and and safety, friendliness, and um, problem solving, difficulty. The trees signified so many complex things that it, when you described a tree, the thing that grew there was almost irrelevant. It, um, there were so many things that a tree signified. So when you're designing a building or you're designing a painting or you're designing a, a character or whatever you're designing, you know, whatever, like start looking at what it is that you're designing and start asking yourself, well, what... What do I want to kind of infuse in that world? What is the kind of concept that I want to kind of convey? And then take that concept and start breaking it down and start understanding, okay, well, what is it about a tree? Movement, family, being together, you know, accountability. What do these words mean? And how can I translate that, that meaning into something three-dimensional, into something concrete? Because this is what architecture or painting or any of these things design really is. It's about taking something literal, turning it abstract, and then making it literal again. And in this process, actually a loop, and in this process, you create richness, and you create architecture, you create humanity.
Because while you're doing this, you are infusing yourself into this. Right. I know it's probably a bit random as a stream, but oh no. Yeah, our internet died. This is very frustrating. Oh, that's so random. Okay, well, it showed on my screen that it cut out. Um, couldn't see you guys. Sorry, um, I need to get a proper second screen. The streaming and second screen thing isn't working. Um, let me just. Uh... Anyway, okay, so I actually, I was just going to wrap up. Um, so, um, are there any questions that you guys want, have, have, have got, or you want me to talk about? Um, yes, yes. Yes, Mel, um, absolutely right in terms of um, abstraction. And extraction um that is definitely one of the main ways that you can kind of create a narrative inside a project um you know if you're designing something very simple you know just by absolutely breaking it open and kind of understanding what it is and complexifying so what's for dinner <laughs> uh chicken salad <laughs> Mel, you're such a troll. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> what's your What's for your dinner, Mel? What are you having for dinner? If it is dinner for you. So I'm just kind of like cross folding my arms. So I'm, I'm actually I'm kind of I'm showed you guys so. Very weird thing because I, I use my iPad as my second screen, um, and it's lately it's just been freezing. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's actually scary to know that you know if you look at um, Buster Rogers, um, Dodgy is dead. <laughs> I just food. I'm hungry. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Mel. <laughs> um, I don't know yet. Oh, you don't know what you're having. Yeah. Um, must be single. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just joking. Um, piano. Oh, Renzo Piano. Yeah. I was like, you want to play piano? Um, so Mel, where did you study? Out of curiosity. I'm, I'm just... And Fuxia, what are you going to have for dinner? Rodo Mantle, what are you having for dinner? <laughs> The stream has devolved into something <laughs> just casual, having a good time. It's actually perfect. Um, so I've got to ask you guys a question. You know, I, I find um, um, it's it's actually it's so much fun doing these kinds of presentations. Is that did you guys get a lot out of that? Did you did you enjoy that? I say that because that is a good place to be. I wish Alfred was the same. Yeah, well.
Thanks for the mindset. Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing for me, why the stream is like really cool is because it, it kind of allow, allows me to uh, kind of run through my own process and thinking that goes behind the designs that I do and be able to, you know, kind of share that information while I'm doing it. And hopefully, kind of get some. Um, and I mean, obviously, there's there's a myriad of different ways we can do this kind of stream. Is there something else that you guys would like to do or think about or you know, discuss? Don't mind mentioning on the Discord. I think it's easier, you know, kind of having an idea of who of telling a story or, or kind of what kind of presentational stream I want to do. Like for me, this was this was actually talking to Fuxia about a project that she visual designs. So you by that, what do you mean? You mean actual my actual work might be my kind of process. You actually will see me doing actual design work um, because that's actually going to be coming up because I have pretty intense deadlines coming up and. I a lot of work in design work so because of that um, i'll definitely be sharing that online so they will be sharing of, of the design process okay all right Okay, I like that a lot. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think um, you know that's kind of what Fuxia alluded to. She been helping out and kind of giving a advice, maybe or advice, maybe the wrong word. Peak, uh, I guess, um, because it's it's exactly that. It's like you you know if you um, I, I look at the things a little bit differently, and so I, like you said, like how would you how would you design that? You know, okay. What makes a cyberpunk police headquarters for argument's sake? Or, um, yeah, I actually let's do that. I'm actually really keen for that. So maybe maybe that's what we do. We can do like as a topic, um, beforehand, and we can you guys can maybe we do it on the Discord. So I have a bit of time to think about it because it's not so simple. You know, I'm not like a I'm not bored by any stretch of the imagination. Um, or we could even do it live. You know, like, no, actually, you know, let's do it live. We'll do it live. We can brainstorm it together almost. Um, the drawing quality will be pretty average, I think. Um, you know, kind of this this kind of design sketching work that I'm doing here. Not won't be resolved or anything. The thinking will be there. Yeah, let's do that. I'm keen. So um I think yeah, let's do we can do one of those this week probably. I'll let you guys know on the Discord when I'm when I can do another stream. Um maybe Mel and if you're keen, I, again, I say you can you can maybe join the Discord. Um, I can invite you if you can. Or I'll send you an invite chat. Otherwise, for the most part, for the rest of the evening, the rest of the day, have a fantastic time. Um, it's been so great to be able to share this with you, and I, I just love that you guys are here and listening and sharing this with me, um, sharing my passion for architecture and, and design, and very cool. Um, Otherwise, uh, have a fantastic evening again and take it easy. Be in touch. All right. Peace out.